podcast's far too big to look at, kid. Your ears won't open wide enough, and you're constantly surrounded by the swirling stream of Columbia House Party. Jake, what's up, man? <laughs> that was silly. I like that. Yeah, don't don't laugh in the middle of my intros. Come on, man. <laughs> I couldn't help it. We can take out my laugh. Whatever. We got editing. No, we don't need to take out your laugh. That's. <laughs> We're off the rails. 30, 30 seconds in, we a new. Yeah, record. we're already in, uh, already some dead air. Sweet, sweet dead air. I did too good a job <laughs> with the intro. Is the problem? You did. By the way, I saw someone uh, tweet. I think it was Ian Cohen at some point that the first two minutes of the album we're discussing today are like the first three or four minutes of every podcast, where it's just the yeah. people just kind of yeah, rambling, that's... getting their bearings about them, and then uh, then getting down to business. I would say that is pretty accurate. That's us. We're just we're just trying to set the tone of the album. <laughs> it was on purpose, is what everyone yeah. should take from it. Yeah, not quite as literally scripted as the say anything intro, but you know, in the same in the same spirit. Yeah, we're just trying to we're trying to set the tone and the feeling so people can go on this ride with us. Oh boy, are there going to be some feelings? But Jake, fill us in. Where in the vast Conor Burst discography? Our, our catalog are we going today so obviously carnival burst slash bright eyes have a lot of records we could have discussed there are many places to go all of sort of varying sounds so i feel like any of the albums could be and maybe will be one day episodes of their own but in deciding where to go i thought i would go to the album that really sold me on the group. It wasn't the first Bright Eyes album I heard, but it was the one, the first one where I was like, oh, okay, I can get into this. Um, I find Bright Eyes to be an interesting one for me because like a lot of people, I was very into them in high school, but I find myself to be much more into them and much more appreciative of them today than I was then. So I thought I went with the album that I think best represents what I find interesting about their work uh, and sort of maybe the most varied, if not the most interesting, uh, or maybe the most interesting, depending on how you look at it. So that clumsy ass intro aside, today we are talking about Bright Eyes' 2002 album, Lifted. Or the stories in the soil keep your ear to the ground. <laughs> Pictures far too big to look at, kid. Your eyes won't open wide enough, and you're constantly surrounded by the swirling stream of what is and what was. What we all made our predictions, but the truth still is now. But if you want to see the future go Stare into a cloud All right, Jake, so you you set up a little bit why you wanted to uh, discuss Bright Eyes and why you wanted to discuss uh, Lifted as an album in particular. We are in a, a bit of a groove right now with stuff from the early 2000s that holds up pretty well and i think jake you said you know when you go back to bright eyes it's something that resonates with you still even though you were a big fan in high school in 2017 at consequence of sound philip kasaurus kind of wrote about exactly that that bright eyes might best encompass the idea that there's a difference between what you listen to in high school and what you grew up on and that there's a difference in how those things hold up for you i think for me you know bright eyes is particularly relevant in that they came out kind of on the eve of file sharing, basically Uh, like Mm. Conor Burst and Bright Eyes were like one of the first live journal era success stories. Yeah. I think that's a very good way to put it actually. Yeah. Um, I I also think too, an element of what helps Conor's songwriting hold up is that, um, you know, in a recent episode, we talked about dashboard confessional and how, his approach, at least in the genre, 
was novel in that he approached a lot of the emotions that come from relationships uh, attacking the emotion itself. And I, I feel like while Connor navigates that differently, um, there is a maturity in his approach to these things, even though he was only 22 at the, at the time of this album, that makes it hold up a little better than some of the other stuff in the genre around the early 2000s. Yeah, and I think I'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but your point about him being 22, I think is relevant because that was kind of his whole story at first. Like he was just like the young prodigy and then everyone just kind of, I think with this album, especially everyone had to sort of start taking him seriously as a musician, as an artist and not just like the young songwriter guy. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, uh, you know, the fact that his, his first kind of breakthrough was at 18 with, uh, letting off the happiness. Like that's, that's yeah, it's a it's it's a good point. This kind of like, you know, he was on the radar, but this was like, oh, no, he's on the radar in like a serious and potentially commercially successful way. Um, the other thing I find really interesting about Bright Eyes, and we'll probably talk on it with some of the songs specifically, is not necessarily my attachment to him in the music. But when you zoom out, I feel like Ober's kind of bridges. Uh, and I know that Bright Eyes gets included with the the kind of emo boom of the early 2000s a lot but i think he has so much folk sensibility that you can draw a line through a lot of 60s and 70s folk revival stuff through connor and to uh, a lot of the like maybe not emo but but some of the emo stuff that uses those folk elements now like i think you can trace a line if you're careful through you know, Neil Young and John Prine through Conor O'Burst or the Weaker Thans and get to bands like the Hotel Year and Big Thief. And like, those aren't direct because we're talking 20, 30 year gaps in between each one. Uh, but I feel like he does have a hand in kind of threading kind of the the peak of the, the folk revival before our time and the way that folk is included in a lot of like the emo subgenres now. Yeah, and I think that because he sort of started from a more quote unquote emo perspective and because he was associated with all the Saddle Creek bands I feel like less so now because I think he does but I find it interesting that he wasn't sort of included especially with like I'm Wide Awake It's Morning and uh, Casadega how he wasn't really associated with sort of that rise in the alt country world as sort of like the Wilco's and the My Morning Jackets was even though he's in Monsters of Folk with Jim James from My Morning Jacket uh, and M. Ward, who are both very much in the sort of alt-country, southern rock, folk revival world. And it t- I feel like it took Connor a while to sort of be accepted as that, even though he kind of has always been that, just also with a million other ideas that take him in different directions. Yeah, for sure. And it's... You know, and that that extends beyond this, too, to where you get to uh, the way he works with artists now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess. Oh, the the other thing I wanted to ask you specifically was why why lifted? Um, And I know we normally do the album ranking stuff at the end of the podcast. And I know you have some hot takes when it comes to Bright Eyes album rankings, at least relative to some other rankings that have been put out there. But in Connor's (laughs) estimation, he seems I, I, I think He thinks it's this is the best Bright Eyes album because he tweeted out a link to uh, an Uproxx ranking of their albums that had lifted at number one. So I don't know if that's Connor just spreading uh, that piece or if that's an endorsement of lifted as the top one. But what's uh, what's your take there? Yeah, I think that what I would say is that I think lifted is the best one, even though it's not my favorite one. But I think that it's the closest to a fully the fully realized whole of all of bright eyes many many parts is what i would say yeah that's that's fair um so i think that's probably a good point to take a very quick break and we're going to talk about lifted or the stories in the soil keep your ear to <laughs> after this So we discussed a lot of the early days of Conroe Burst in our episode on Desaparecidos, which you should go listen to if you want to hear that part of it, because I'm not going to do it again. But to very quickly recap, he was in a band called Commander Venus. 
in the mid nineties. They ended in 97, 98, which is around the time that he began his career as Bright Eyes. In 1998, he released a collection of songs recorded 1995 to 1997, which were 20 songs he'd been writing throughout the Commander Venus days. It is an extremely uh, varied album. There's features on Convoluted like was what I was going to say, but your, yeah. your choice is uh, <laughs> a little better. <laughs> a lot of drum machines, keyboards, very odd vocals. It was not particularly well received. He would follow that up later in 1998 in November with Letting Off the Happiness, which I think you could probably call the first real Bright Eyes record. Uh, it was only 10 tracks and much more focused. That album featured Matt McGinn of Cursive on bass and also featured Kevin Barnes of, of Montreal and Jeremy Barnes of Neutral Milk Hotel in Beirut, which would sort of speak to a lot of Bright Eyes collaborative properties as they would go forward. Letting Off the Happiness was reasonably well received. It got a 6.8 from Pitchfork. Uh, it was mostly recorded in Oberst's family basement on an eight-track recorder. He followed that up with the Every Day and Every Night EP in 1999, and in May 2000 released, I guess what you would call the breakthrough, Bright Eyes record, Fevers and Mirrors, in typical Pitchfork fashion. On release, it was given a 5.4, but it has since been re-reviewed and changed to a 9.0, and was also named the 170th best album of the 2000s, by said Pitchfork. The main musicians were, as usual, Conor Oberst and Mike Mogus. We will talk a lot more about Mike Mogus in a bit, uh, but it also included Tim Kasher of Cursive and Joe Knapp of Sun Ambulance. In 2012, Ian Cohen said, Fevers and Mirrors isn't degraded from being removed from the bullshit of your youth, and in any context, it's a tremendous record that is critic-proof in the same way Violent Femmes, Pinkerton, and yes, The Smiths are. Scoff if you must. But let me ask you this. How many people do you know that got into Morrissey as teens? Okay, now how many got started in their 30s? Up to this point, Obersa released some decent material culminating in letting off the happiness, his on Avery Island to fevers in the airplane over the sea. But beyond that, his work as Commander Venus and Solo was mostly notable for the youth of the person who made it. It was all very precocious and little of it stands up now, which is Part of why I would argue, this is me, Jake, saying this, not Ian Cohen saying this, that hmm. uh, Fe Fevers and Mirrors is sort of the breakthrough and the beginning of Bright Eyes as we think of them today. I wouldn't say that entire record holds up. Uh, I know it's it's lower on my rankings, I would say, than I think on others, but there is definitely a lot of what was to come on there and definitely a lot of over songwriting talent on display there. I think that what stands out for me, like when I go back and listen to Bright Eyes is like, that's the emo album, right? Like that's the, even though he had more con commercial success with Wide Awake eventually, Fever and Mirrors is I think what gets him locked into the emo discussion. Whereas, you know, this, the album we're talking about today gets a little folkier and, and then, you know, Wide Awake is almost like indie pop. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I, I feel like the, the emo, like if we're splitting hairs on genres, um, Fever yeah. and Mirrors is kind of where he got rooted into that conversation. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is because of songs like this one, The Calendar Hung Itself. Does he kiss your eyelids in the morning when you start to raise your head? And does he sing to you incessantly from the space between your bed and walls? You walk around all day at school, his feet inside your shoes, looking down every few steps to pretend he walks with you. Or does he know that place below your neck is your favorite to be touched? And does he cry through broken sentences like I love you far too much? Does he lay awake listening to your Worried you smoke too many cigarettes Is he coughing now on a bathroom floor For every speck of tile There's a thousand more you won't ever see But must hold inside yourself eternally
I like the specificity in the song title as if um, if you came across a calendar hanging, you you might suspect someone did it to the calendar. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Connor has a big uh, it's not quite follow up or dashboard, but the the song title names throughout, especially on Lifted. Is, uh, Truly. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. I remember finding that when I was in high school and first listening to them, not I don't I don't want to say off putting because that's the wrong term, but it was definitely one of those things of like, ooh, what does this mean? It's an odd name for a song. <laughs> yeah, why Why is it a whole sentence? Or or in one case on uh, Lifted, why is it an entire conversation <laughs> in the song title? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I do agree with you that sort of the emo bright eyes, and like really what's kind of, I don't know if ironic's the right word, odd about, in my opinion, Bright Eyes being put in the emo world is that I would argue that Fevers and Mirrors is kind of the only one of all of his albums that I would consider like emo. Yeah. I mean, we've discussed before how we don't care that much, like as much as some people do to, to cut those lines. Giant, but giant like, quotation marks around yeah. uh, emo. But yeah, I, I would think the, I think the bulk of the, um, of the Bright Eyes catalog falls more into like, folk and lo-fi than what's classically emo or even like that midwest emo um as things get grouped now but yeah that's that's the one album i think and i think you kind of do see a transition across his three biggest albums from kind of what the styling is on fevers and mirrors to then lifted to then wide awake like i think you you can kind of chart that as well yeah i think i definitely agree with that by the way th- this is this is where people can picture me in excel trying to graph emo <laughs> versus <laughs> folk Versus lo-fi uh, across three albums, like a, a time series graph of of what the music sounds like. Pick the I'm genre. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. No, it, it makes it easy for me to not have to have these arguments on the air <laughs> when I just like, Blake will figure it out. Uh, so after a brief break from Bright Eyes to release the first De Desaparecidos record in February 2002, Bright Eyes. Which, released- as a reminder from an earlier episode, <laughs> sorry, uh, rules uh, De Desaparecidos were an awesome side project. They were. I miss them. I hope they come back. Even though, like, I feel greedy. Bright Eyes are finally coming back. I'm like, no, bring yeah. back the other one. Also, I think one thing that we neglected to... I know we touched on Day Sparacitos, like, 2015 Day Sparacitos just a little bit. Did we talk about Te Amo, Camila Vallejo? I think I played it because it's my favorite song on the album. But I right. don't know how deep we went into yes, it. Yes, a song, a love song for a Chilean Communist Party politician is just <laughs> chef's kiss. Yes, for, indeed. Uh, for De Sparacitos. Uh Yes. So they released the first De Sparacitos record, Read Music, Speak Spanish, in February of 2002. Bright Eyes then released Lifted, or The Story is in the Soil, Keep Your Ear to the Ground, on August 13th, 2002. Oberst was 22 when the album was released, which covered a lot of the press coverage around him and the band, as Ian Cohen pointed out before. Lifted in my opinion, represents, as we're sort of saying, a bit of a style shift for Oberst and the group in general. It's way more expansive. Uh, I wouldn't call it experimental, especially not as experimental as he would get later in his career, but I definitely think it's the biggest, in quotes, Bright Eyes record. Uh, It's definitely a far cry from the lo-fi sound of his previous work. This is an album that features strings, horns, mandolins, glockenspiels. Most of the songs don't even have choruses. As we'll get into a song later in the record, it opens with Ober saying, give me some goddamn timpani. So that's sort of the sounds he was going for. You know Bright Eyes kept that glock on them. Of that, course. That glockenspiel. You need the glockenspiel. Them and Los Campesinos repping for glockenspiels. There you go. There are a ton of musicians that played on this album. Of course, there's please don't list them all. It would be a very me thing to list them all, but please don't. I won't list them all, but I will list some. Uh, other than Oberst and Mogus, we have Matt Folkt, Clint Schneis from Cursive, Mike Sweeney also played drums, Todd Bacali from The Faint, Blake Sennett and Jenny Lewis provide backup vocals, of course, from Rilo Kiley, Greta Cohn of Cursive and many other products play products, projects, played cello. Matt McGinn of Cursive once again played bass. Ted Stevens also of Cursive plays guitar. Arenda Fink of Azure Ray plays trumpet and sang backup vocals along with many others. All told, there are 25 different musicians credited on this album, including Katie Muth, 
who played Oboe. And the only reason I'm pointing that out is because Katie Muth is now a member of Pennsylvania State Senate. And I think that's cool. That is cool. Uh, Also, almost every one of those people being involved with Saddle Creek Records in some way. Yes. (laughs) It's just uh, they this album is just like a a Saddle Creek's record album. It's not even necessarily a Bright Eyes one. Pretty much. And there are a lot of cursive. Yeah, it's good stuff. It is. Um, Oberst told Omaha Weekly in 2002 that it was the most enormous production I've ever worked on as far as arrangement and scope. I demoed the record twice. I recorded the songs once in Athens and then did a demo here and each time fleshed out the songs a little more and kind of came out with the parts I thought would be good. Both Andy and Mike took my ideas and ran with them. There's no beginning to the story. A bookshelf sinks into the sand. In a language learned, the forgotten turn is studied once again. It's a shocking bit of footage viewed from a shitty TV screen. You can squint at it through snowy static to make out the meaning. And keep on stretching the antenna, hoping that it will come clear. We need some reception, a higher message. Just tell us what to fear, cause I don't know what tomorrow brings. Line with a such possibility But I won't be frightened when I'm awoken from this dream And return to that which gave birth to me He also took this expansiveness on the road. Uh, He told Lazy Eye in 2002, we're taking a 14 piece band, but there will be 20 of us total. He said with a look of concern on his face, something (laughs) like 13 will be in a bus and the rest will ride in my van. This tour is by far an anomaly, which I can see like the necessity of that many musicians because of how these songs sound. But like, God damn. It's a lot yeah. of musicians. That's, uh, that's also, it's just like not efficient for a tour. Like, how are you going to make enough money? <laughs> right. Especially uh, at this stage. Like, Bright Eyes Now, yeah, you could probably get away with that. But yeah, this was the big break with 25 people. The other thing that's, I think, interesting with the record is for someone who started his career notably writing very personal point of view songs. Uh, Ober said that these songs are mostly represented by archetypes, uh, though obviously with some personal experience in. He said, I just started writing songs and they weren't like the old ones. It's nothing I thought about ahead of time. It just ended up not being so dark. I still think there's some sad moments on the record. I try to use whatever tools possible to convey whatever you want to call the truth of the song. I'm willing to draw from my own life or craft something to achieve something that's real at the end of the song, but that's just what writing is. Anyone who gets hung up on if a song applies to my life or something I created has missed the point. And yeah, it's uh, sorry I, to no, jump in there. Like I don't, you know, I, I certainly see the, if not happier, the like less m- morose um, songwriting here, but I don't think, you know, when he says that he still has some sad songs, I don't even know if it's, there was obvious, there are obviously sad points, but what I found lyrically in this album, and even if it's through archetypes is like, especially for a 22 year old, and especially in this genre at this time, it's a lot more um, like self-challenging kind of about like, you know, we again, we talked in Dashboard about how it's more confronting the actual emotions himself. Well, here I feel like it's there's a lot of like him challenging how to be unselfish with those emotions and how to be unselfish with your actions. And I don't you know, that theme doesn't come up in every song, but that's you know, it's almost like a, not learning to love, but like learning how to be a person who is not selfish in, you know, or doesn't let their emotions make them selfish as you go through some of these things. Um, And again, for, for a 22 year old to have that level of, even if it's not, you know, it's imperfect, but there's a level of maturity there. And I, I think that's again, part of what helps it hold up a little bit. Yeah. And I think it's also sort of interesting in 
the context of where his writing would go as he got, as he went on in his career where you have, you know, I'm wide awake is very much just like a collection of folk songs, not necessarily from any perspective of, or any personal perspective. I would argue that digital ash weirdly has his most personal writing, even though it's his least personal sounding record because it's all keyboards. Then Casadega is very much an old school, like folk record and collection of songs. People's key is a lot about spiritualism and things like Halle Selassie. So I think it's his, idea that like figuring out what is personal to him and what isn't misses the point of his music is sort of where he would take a lot of his work further in his career for sure and and you know we're gonna uh we're gonna get into some of the songs and some of the examples of this after this So, uh, sorry, we just played a clip uh, a little earlier we forgot to introduce. Um, that was the song Method Acting, which is the second song on the album. Uh, the one we played off the top is the opener called Big Picture, which if you're wondering why Jake actually wanted to do this album, it's because there's a nine-minute opener that's only partially a song <laughs> and seems just like a stream of consciousness session of Connor on his guitar. Uh, I feel like that's the real reason Jake wanted to do this. And it's not even the best long song on the album. Hey, because yeah. there's more. In your bag, as they say, Jake. <laughs> um, speaking of long songs and complicated arrangements, I think now is a good time for us to take a quick little break from talking directly about Conor Oberst and talk about Mike Mogus, who I don't think gets the credit he deserves for the career that he's had. I think when we were talking in our Death Cab for Cutie episode about the amazing and varied and impressive work that Chris Walla has done in his career. I think it's fair to say that Mike Mogus comes from a similar vein. And if Chris Walla was sort of master producer guy for Barsook, Mike Mogus was absolutely master producer guy for Saddle Creek. Some bands that Mike Mogus has produced include Cursive, Rilo Kylie, The Elected, The Faint, Jenny Lewis and the Watson Twins, M. Ward, Monsters of Folk, Julian Casablancas, She and Him, Man Man, and Rustin Kelly. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Great. Oh, you, yeah. You get the, you get Zoe Deschanel in there. You get, uh, you know, Rustin, you get that dirt emo get from the dirt Rustin emo. Kelly. I don't know if that's the one he produced, but. Uh, he, he had the, no, he didn't produce the Dirt Emo EP, um, uh, but he, but he has Julian Casablancas in there, that really yeah. weird Madman man man record. Yeah, he's great. Obris told Lazy Eye into the two that he considers Mike Mogus to be his only real collaborator. And I think that it's fair to say that even though Bright Eyes is often held up as a Connor Oberst project, Mike Mogus is as much a part of the group as anyone and is still one of the only three credited members of the band in 2020. So Mike Mogus is clearly a big part of this. Ober said in 2002 that letting off the happiness is the first thing Mike recorded without his brother, AJ. Uh, we've sort of grown up together. He's become a really amazing producer in my mind. Our relationship is built on the fact that we learned how to play together and everything is fair game. I can give my opinions about what microphone we should use and where it should be in the room, and he'll comment about a lyric. He's just one of my best friends and the only guy I consider a genius. He would tell The New Yorker in 2005, The Lifted album in 2002 was me and the producer Mike Mogus and this other friend of ours, Andy Lamaster. When I'm arranging stuff with Mike, since we don't write out music, I write a lot of parts on keyboard. Then we show the cello part to the cello player and half of it makes sense and half of it doesn't. And he'll say, you can't really play that. <laughs> Which I think is a interesting way to write these expansive songs. Uh, Obers wanted to say that Mike is very technical. He deals with every kind of instrument or musical thing, which is kind of strange, but at the same time, he's not a tech guy. I can describe things to him in the most non-musical terms, like I want this to sound like ice cracking or I want this to sparkle and he'll know. All right. And I think the reason that the reason that Mike Mogus is so impressive as it relates to this album is, as we said before, there are 25 credited musicians on this thing, <laughs> and Mogus was tasked with a lot of the arrangements. And I think these arrangements can sort of best be seen on this record as a song I alluded to earlier about starting with some goddamn timpani. <laughs> uh, the final track on the record, Let's Not Shit Ourselves to Love and Be Loved. Here we go. 
Could I get a goddamn timpani roll to start this goddamn song? Tonight is a goddamn song. For all you goddamn people. Of the wilderness, a baby cries hard in an apartment complex. As I pass in a car buried under the influence, the city's driving me out of my mind. I've seen a child, he's caught in the sad trap of gravity. He falls from the lowest branch of the apple tree and lands in the grass and we. For his dignity, this time he will not aim so high Let's just hope that is enough Whoa! Whoa! That song's also cool because I mean obviously it's big musically, but there's the part once Connor really gets going, like that's the closest thing to a Desparcito song on this album yeah, too. Where like he lets the he lets the vocals go a little punk. He has I find he does that a lot a lot on these more restrained Bright Eyes records. Like you hear it at the end of also the closing track on I'm Wide Awake with Road to Joy, where he sort of lets the let's fuck it up boys make some noise part, or he sort of lets that out of him so i wonder if it's a closing track thing for him yeah maybe just let let that thing sing let the glock (laughs) sing as it were you know (laughs) yeah exactly the Um, way that that phrase is always used and intended (laughs) uh so lifted believe it or not did have a single and it's probably the most up to this point the most successful bright eyes song and i don't like it (laughs) Uh, the song I'm talking about, of course, is Lover, I Don't Have to Love. Uh, I would say... Now, did pro- you like this song better um, when it was redone by Brand New as Sick Transit Gloria, Glory Babes, <laughs> or when it was redone by Panic at the Disco with a little more pomp after that? <laughs> uh, yes, kind of. Um, I actually, I liked this song in high school, but I feel like it hasn't... It doesn't really click for me anymore. It's probably one of my least favorite Bright Eyes songs, if I'm being honest, even though it's arguably one of his bigger hits. They even made a music video for it, which is a karaoke video. It was very notably covered by Betty Severt, whose version was played extensively in the season three episode of the OC, The Undertow, uh, because of course it does. This song quotes Catcher in the Rye, which I asked your name, you asked the time. A thing that I want to talk about or talk around this song, I suppose, with about with you can't speak today i find it i always find interesting when like a band's one of a band's big hits of a band that i really really love is not one of my favorite songs do you have any songs of bands that are sort of like notable songs but aren't songs you like from bands you Hmm. you consider in your top bands yeah, other, that's a tough one. Other than like, you know, like the later Fall Out Boys, I'm not counting. I'm just talking about like from albums yeah. that you like, you enjoy. I mean, Fall Out Boys is an interesting example because like Dance Dance is not one of my favorite tracks. And it was like one of the ones responsible for them breaking through because of its Madden soundtrack inclusion and stuff like that. So uh, Fall Out Boys is not a poor example. I'm trying to think like I, I'm sure there are a lot of ones like in the pop punk, like early 2000s, mid 2000s pop punk, where, you know, the song that got a band popular wasn't, you know, you, you get that layer of, you know, Jake-ness where it's like, well, that's not, that's not actually what they sound like, or that's not what I like about them. Um, I'm drawing a blank right this second, but there are definitely yeah. examples of that. Um, do you have any other ones that, that come to mind? I mean, 
I do, but they're all from albums that I'm like, it, it's in that vein of like albums. I don't really like, like later green day stuff I think is on there or yeah. like even like a bunch of stuff on like blink Way two's California, which is an album I like, but <laughs> like has some real clunkers on there. Uh, but I, that's why I, kind of my point about this one that I find so interesting that it's on like what would be considered one of the classic bright eyes records. And I just like, don't, like this song. Uh, I remember I saw Bright Eyes the one and only time I saw them in 2005 uh, at the docks when it was still the docks on, uh, on the digital ash tour. And they played this in the encore and everyone went fucking crazy. And that was one of those like, Oh, this is a big song kind of moment. It definitely has some two thousands emo lyrics, I would say, but I don't know if that really, as we already talked about, it doesn't really suit Bright Eyes. Uh, there's a weird question in that Lazy Eye interview I've quoted a couple times that I think is very much of the times and the way emo was discussed. That's kind of a reductive question about girls at his shows who sing along to the song with tears in their eyes. Uh, Ober simply said, I don't know what to say about that. I'm glad they made a connection with the music and want to feel empathy, but at the same time, and then it trails off. So I feel like he didn't really know what to make of this either. To get a sense of what we're talking about, this is Lover I Don't Have to Love. that song more more than you do i do wonder though how much of it is just like it reminds me of so many other songs that were released in like the five years that followed this yeah it's like oh yeah that's the formula Let, let's all whisper sing. like you know there's a you can draw a line from conor burst to yin yang twins in terms of like let's whisper the first part of this song <laughs> deep, deep cut there, you could sorry. i think but i do think your point about it being like almost literally sick transit gloria is not wrong like it also kind of sounds like cursive songs from the domestica era which is around this time and i think it is just very much of its time but i don't like it as much as other songs from that time i guess yeah and i think too like what uh what's weird i guess is that like it became one of bright eyes bigger songs and like bright eyes is obviously known for you know like we've said kind of some of the sadder leaning or or at least the like really well-written songs and i don't know that that's like a great example of it. Like the yeah. big picture couldn't be a single because of the length and scope, but it's got things like it's cool if you keep quiet, but I like singing. And, you know, I think I'll be returning now to that town where I was born. And you have more on like, when we get to you will, you will, you will. Um, there's the lyric, you are the reoccurring kind. You never really leave my mind. And there's not, 
you know, for a song like this one to kind of cut through and be well regarded and be like borrowed from by other acts, you know, I, I don't think it's one of the better like Connor songwriting songs on the album. Yeah. And I think especially when you compare it to sort of where he would go as he grew older, like you mm-hmm. think of a, I think of a song like I must belong somewhere off Casadega, which I think is maybe his best written song. Like, I think that song is brilliant. And then this is just kind of like, okay, he wrote a emo pop song, which I, there's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with that, but it's just kind of not what I look to him for. The, the best written Bright Eyes song was their cover of Devil Town, which was written by Daniel Johnston. That's that's the best <laughs> Fair point. written Fair point. Bright Eyes song. Um, also, you know, this album's a good indication of this, but you, you get it all over Bright Eyes, um, like a big Daniel Johnston influence oh, yeah. on, uh, on Connor as well. Um, perhaps not coincidentally with Lover I Don't Have to Love being a single and being sort of well-known and well-received, at least compared to the rest of his work at this point. Uh, Ober seemed very prepared for what he saw as an eventual breakthrough to the mainstream with Lifted. Uh, he was featured in Rolling Stone, not in the article that we have talked about a couple times that called him the next Bob Dylan. That was on the press tour for I'm Wide Awake It's Morning. But he was featured in Rolling Stone for this record, which was well-reviewed by Rolling Stone. He told Lazy Eye in regards to being featured in Rolling Stone, it's cool, but for as many people who say that it's great, there are more who will say that it sucks. There will be a backlash from the indie population about any mainstream success. I don't worry about the indie population. Anyone who's going to stop liking your band because of the fact that others like you or because you're covered in the press or MTV are probably not into music for the right reason. It's probably better to shed those supporters anyway. You feel like an asshole for forgetting people over time. For the most part, everyone understands. It was way easier in the past. You could roll into a town and play for a hundred kids and ask for a place to stay and get taken to someone's house and party. Now it's not like that. There's more of a barrier between us and the audience. I want to make relationships with people, but I don't even have time to be good friends with my actual friends. I've learned to read people pretty quickly and escape if it's going to be a real awkward situation. Which sounds like a guy who knew exactly what his career was going to be. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a you can hear, too, on this album, like where he was going to go. Like I mentioned earlier, I think it's you can trace through, you know, Fevers and Mirrors through Lifted to where he went on Wide Awake, which was his most commercially successful one. Uh, And I think you can hear where it's going to go on this album. I mentioned you will, you will, you will earlier. And I think that's probably the, the one of the better examples of it. Yeah, I think when I said off the top that this is sort of the cumulative whole of the Bright Eyes experiment, or however however I phrased that 35 minutes ago, I think that this is this whole album is sort of a blueprint for the Bright Eyes discography. Like you have Make War, which is very much a country detour that's both political, as is Let's Not Shit Ourselves, which would speak to a lot of his later political writing, especially in sort of the, oh, uh, not Rock Against Bush. I forget what his Against Bush thing was called but where he'd go there uh, and also the sort of country or folkier sounds on Casadega. Uh, I agree with you. I think you will, you will, you will, you will. That to me sounds the most on this album. Like I'm wide awake. It's morning, which I, I would assume is probably the most well-known bright eyes record. I was originally going to put make war as the song to discuss here, but I think you will is more appropriate just because it leads into his major, major breakthrough. Well, you say that I treat you like a book on a shelf I don't take you out that often Cause I know that I completed you And that's why you are here that's the reason you stay here. How awful that must feel. Now I write when I'm away letters that you'll never read. You said go explore those other women, the geography of their bodies but there's just one map you'll need you're a boomerang you'll see you will return to me
don't And my plans will all be ruined If you don't, I'll start drinking Like the way I drank before oh, And I, I just won't have a future anymore The direction that Bright Eyes would take, at least with I'm Wide Awake, uh, It's Morning, seems to have been on purpose. Uh, in the press tour for that album in 2005, Obers told The New Yorker that the acoustic direction was in response to the grandiosity of Lifted. He said, I mean, I'm really glad we did Lifted, but it became this grandiose project and there wasn't a lot of space in it. It was layer upon layer of instruments built up. I wanted a Beach Boys pet sounds or a Leonard Cohen's Death of a Ladies Man feel, an immense orchestral wave. But when that was over, I thought, there's no space in this music. It's too much. My immediate reaction to that was to want to do a record that was just guitar and my voice with everything stripped down, taking what we're doing live a lot and going for more of one of those 70s folk records that I like a lot. You know, Neil Young or Jackson Brown or Joni Mitchell, which I do think, to Ober's credit, is exactly what I'm Wide Awake this Morning sounds like, to the point that I have a very clear memory of playing that record in the car and my dad stopping it and saying, why are you listening to folk music? This sounds like what I used to listen to. So he clearly succeeded. Yeah, there you go. And yeah, you can, I mean, you can hear it on this album. You can hear, especially on the next one, like, like we said, this kind of transition from, you know, getting lumped in with emo to, to being kind of the connecting piece or one of the connecting pieces from um, 60s, 70s folk to, or I guess even 80s folk to uh, current folk that has, you know, those emo elements in it. So, you know, you get a little, well, Kevin Devine sound, Sharon Van Etten, that kind of <laughs> stuff. You can you can trace through uh, some of the Bright Eyes stuff. Uh, so, Jake, did people, uh, before we get to uh, Wide Awake, where he would go, did people enjoy Lifted? Oh, yes. When it was released, it received a 7.7 .7 from Pitchfork, a 4.5 out of 5 from All Music, 8 out of 10 from Spin, a B-plus in The Village Voice, Rolling Stone named it the 4th best album of 2002, Blender named it the 52nd greatest indie rock album of all time, it was the first Bright Eyes record to hit the Billboard 100, it spent one week at 161, and as of 2009, it has sold 340,000 copies in the United States. In 2003, the band made their network television debut on Letterman, which they did not play a song from Lifted. Oberst told Stereo Gum in 2020, it was weird because Lifted had been out for a while, and as those things go, the record came out, and it took a while for people to catch on. So by the time we got the Letterman offer, I don't know, it was like a year and a half after the record had come out, and we should have just played a song off the record. That would have been the normal smart thing to do from like a commercial point, I guess. <laughs> but I had a bunch of new songs. I was like, let's play a new song. Everyone thought that was weird, like the publicist and Letterman, but they were like, fine, do what you want. So we played this song, Trees Get Wheeled Away. I was very nervous. I've gotten used to it now, those TV shows. But the first time you do it, it's like such a different experience in a regular show. Just cameras coming, flying all around you, in your face. And it doesn't ever sound really that great. It just kind of feels sterile and strange. But I think we did a pretty good job for our first time. As we said, in 2005, Bright Eyes would release I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning and Digital Ash in a Digital Urn on the same day as sort of companion albums that sound nothing alike. In 2007, they would release Casadega, and in 2011, they would release The People's Key. Bright Eyes now consists of Connor Oberst, Mike Mogus, and Nate Walcott. Nate Walcott has played in Connor Oberst's Mystic Valley Band, M. Ward's Band, has also been a keyboard player for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and has played in the studio with U2. And on August 21st of 2020, releasing their first album since 2011 with Down in the Weeds, Where the World Once Was, and the first song we got from it was this song, Persona Non Grata. Getting dressed for a date, put on blue after shave, wore a kill like a kill, hid the way that I felt. Combat boots, fallen leaves, West Village, Halloween, to a Bollywood song, taking shots till we're gone, unwelcome in the autumn. Persona non grata, I'm the last of the best. I'm your thoughts in the swamp There's a playground of children In the shadows of buildings There's a line at the church 
Where your homelessness works Where the stained glass of crimson Meets Ezekiel's visions Saw valley of bones Where no man shall be saved And now you, you come to me Asking that And now you, you come to me And you're asking that Oh, how can we reconcile? Oh, that's, it's good. Jake, are we at the point now where you get to unleash your your album ranking or your your album take? Yeah, I think I will. So again, I am not arguing this as harshly as I do some of my other music takes because I understand that this is not the quote unquote correct take, but it's my take. Oh, so so at in unlike all your other takes that people disagree with, <laughs> that where you're right. You admit that this this time when they disagree with you, they're right. Yes. Um, okay. Yes, exactly. Glad we established Un- that. Unlike my Sufian Stevens takes, which we'll get to another day, in which I am 100% correct. Save it for the Christmas bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my favorite Bright Eyes record is actually Digital Ash and a Digital Urn. I can't really explain why. I just like it the most, and I like when he allows himself to fall into sort of those darker keyboardy places. Maybe it could also be because that's the show I saw him tour when I was in high school. So it left a mark on me, which wouldn't surprise me. Uh, so I have digital action. Number one, I have lifted as we're discussing today at number two, as I said, I think it's the best one. It's just not my favorite. And then I think the one that people will have the most objection to is that my number three bright eyes record is the people's key from 2011, which I know was not the most popular record, but I love it. And I think it's great. Uh, yeah, I, I do not have two of your top three. <laughs> no, I wouldn't imagine my, so. Uh, in my top three, I think I have a more standard ranking. I have it lifted uh, Wide Awake and Fevers and Mirrors. Uh, and I don't feel strongly between two and three there, which I realize is strange because lifted is kind of like the middle ground between those. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like the emo side and I like the folkier side. I like their Daniel Johnson cover Devil Town from Friday Night Lights. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's it's one of the best one of the best things they've done, I think. And then, you know, on on I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning, you get uh, First Day of My Life, which I think is one of if not one of the best Bright Eyes songs, one of the best jobs Connor has done as a songwriter. So yeah, I, I think I think I'd have I'm Wide Awake It's Morning uh, a little ahead of Fevers and Mirrors, but I Fevers and Mirrors being like the first Bright Eyes that I was introduced to also has a, a an impact there. So I, I can't really split those two that much. But Lifted is my uh, Lifted is my favorite Bright Eyes album, or the stories in the soil <laughs> keep your ear to the ground. I will also say neither of us put it on our rankings. But I want to give Casadega some love because it has it's not my favorite by any means, but it has some of my favorite Bright Eyes songs. So I just wanted to give Casadega some love. Yeah, there you go. There's just six Bright Eyes albums that we're going to try to shoehorn into a top three here. Basically. Yeah. All right. uh, We now have to talk songs, Jake. We have to pick one for the mixtape. I think I kind of tip my hand about what my favorite um, one or two from this album uh, are. But to give you a top three I would probably go Let's Not Shit Ourselves, You Will, You Will, You Will, and Bowl of Oranges in some order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have Method Acting, Let's Not Shit Ourselves, and Make War as in some order. So do we get as simple as Let's Not Shit Ourselves is the only one on both of our top threes, or do we feel like something else better represents uh, the discussion? No, I'm happy to go with Let's Not Shit Ourselves, not just because it's on both of ours, uh, but because I do think it represents the album well with the songwriting, the mass musicianship, Mogus's arrangements, and also it's been a while since we put like a nine-minute track on the mixtape. So. Yeah, we got to uh, we got to <laughs> Goldsby it up at some point, right? Right. This is good, though. I think, uh, you know, the, like you said, the mixtape needs a, a little something different. I like where this song goes, and 
Uh, I don't know that I'd ever put a nine nine minute song on a, a real mixtape I was making, but we'll do it here. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that. All right, um, so we have our song from the mixtape. It's Let's Not Shit Ourselves. <laughs> <laughs>